this is what a Danimal looks like after a three hour session with Teal Swan, also known as a spiritual catalyst from YouTube. Um, what you're about to see is the first hour interview I did with her. What happened afterwards was a two hour therapy session with my wife and friend JP and my brother. Uh, mind blowing, heart connected. Thank you Teal for offering this perspective to what the world is starving for, which you would call the emotion during this emotional dark age. Um, her perspectives can plant seeds of immense growth and especially the spiritual and emotional realm. And I have so much respect for her and her message and uh, I actually had the privilege of meeting her at her synchronization workshop in Los Angeles where we had a quite a fun comfortable time on stage together actually where we didn't necessarily agree on everything but we still stayed connected to each other and I hope if anything anyone watching this or listening to this on the podcast will be inspired to surround themselves with not only people you agree with and get along with, but maybe the people with people that offer you a challenging perspective and to realize that one of our greatest gifts we can have in this human experience is our challenges. So uh, yeah, I hope to see Teal and I hope to actually see her one day on one of our retreats. This is your official invitation, Teal. Uh, would love to co-host a workshop with you in the future. Um, my brothers and I, we go around the world hosting retreats on authentic communication and raw honesty. Um, we co-create this process where people experiment with the freedom of featuring their flaws and facing their fears and basically talking about all the things you, they don't want to talk about to actually find out is what connects us the most. And uh, I just resonate so deeply with a lot of Teal's perspectives. And if you're more interested in finding out what we do, definitely check us out on YouTube or our website, robbrows.com. And um, our next retreats are actually the Virgin Islands in January, uh, New Zealand in February, and Australia in April. So we're going international this year, and I just definitely want to thank my wife for uh, basically discovering Teal and getting her, me to go to a workshop with an open mind and an open heart. And I hope and pray the same for you while listening to this interview because uh, Teal's changing the world and um, yeah, definitely an inspiration and a motivation for our transformation. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon, Teal, and enjoy the interview. And if you're interested in the two hour therapy session afterwards, <laughs> uh, let us know. Maybe we can post that at a later time. Cool, have fun and comment below um, whether you like it or you don't. I would love to hear your perspective on her perspective. Peace in. Okay, yeah, you should just dive in. I didn't get a chance to look at that yet. Oh, even better. Okay. I, I like that. Let me, uh, I took some I'm notes. so unprepared. <laughs> Perfect. That's the best, the best plans are unplanned, in my opinion. So firstly, um, what do you think about age? Like, I don't know exactly how old you are, and is that something you typically share? And I'm just curious about what your perspective on why is age, like, a taboo thing around women in general? I'm 30, and I have no issue sharing my age because I don't understand why women have a serious issue. I mean, I understand it logically, but emotionally, um, it doesn't made much sense to me. I think we just are raised in a culture where youth is king. So with men, when you look at our society with men, what really makes you wantable or desirable, I guess, by the opposite sex is money and power. With women, it's youth and beauty. So <laughs> it's kind of like I mean, I've just even seen it. The older that I've gotten, I've I've definitely hit this mark now where men are have got their sights set on or girls in their twenties, and I'm starting to to notice it more now. I can definitely say that. It's not prompting me to really lie about my age, but <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate your answer and the insight on that. I figured you being um, what I would categorize as like a beautiful feminine public figure I was kind of curious what your perspective on that was so it's good to hear and it's kind of surprising to find out we're similar aged I'm 29 so <laughs> cool um and then I'll go to the stuff that I was because I uh for anyone that's like watching this and interested how we got connected I uh attended your synchronization workshop at UCLA and um I was one of the ones chosen on stage. And how do you make those choices? Could you uh, clarify that for anyone watching? Well, um, it'll be a little bit difficult for people to completely comprehend because what I'm looking at is a lot different than what other people are looking at. I'm clairvoyant to the point where it's not a mental image, it's a, well, something I'm physically looking at. 
So as I'm looking out at the audience, I'm watching everybody's auric fields and every thought they're thinking is flying through their auric field. And so when somebody has a question in the audience that vibrates at the same frequency as the rest of the people's asking, that means that their question is going to lead to group expansion the most. Then it'll, it's almost like somebody has turned on a flashlight through their energy field. They light up in the room. And that's how I know who to choose. But it's a bit of an adrenaline rush, of course, because I have no idea what people are going to ask me before they sit right next to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And I love how you did the whole workshop. I was, my wife, actually, I was kind of going there to be with her. And I had seen your videos and I was intrigued. It was the same weekend that Bulletproof Conference was going on by Dave Asprey. So I was like kind of torn between. We actually went to both. But um, I definitely thought that was awesome how you chose people just and based on that reasoning and um, people such as my dad are going to be probably watching this interview and what I was really interested and I want to make sure I understand or get a little bit more clarity on your understanding of what exactly do you mean by like vibrational frequency if we can go like real layman's terms like yeah. someone that's never heard vibrations what do you even mean by that and how could that relate to someone like my dad <laughs> okay so for people who are super logic based Everything in the universe is, is made of energy, regardless of whether it's a live or a not alive being. So you could look at a bedpost. It's ultimately energy. The same as my body is ultimately energy. And energy does not stop at physical matter. It's actually in the air. It's everywhere. We are living in and of and as a quantum field of energy. And that energy, the way that it moves, basically, that imparts information. And information becomes form. So the way that those energy particles are vibrating, basically, dictates whether something becomes a human being or a dog or a plant. <laughs> so vi vibration, when we look at it on a super simple level, looks like that. But if we get more complicated, every emotion is also a vibration. And a person in and of themselves holds a specific vibration. Now, in our community, the vibrationally aware community, we're pretty focused on achieving a high vibration because typically the emotion of something like happiness or joy will vibrate at a much higher frequency. It's got a higher pitched sound. It's moving quicker. So you could look at, at what most people call God or source. Source having one of the highest, the highest frequency basically that can be attained. And so the higher your frequency, the closer you are to source energy. So that's the goal, of course, is to, to create a state of living where your vibration is the highest. Okay. That, that was, you kind of answered my follow-up question. It was why do we want to vibrate at a higher frequency? But you're <laughs> saying that's what source vibrates mm -hmm. at, and that is kind of your intention and the people that you surround yourself with, that is their intention as well. Yep. The higher frequencies is, is physical health. Higher frequencies is joy. Higher frequencies is your attachment or connection, should I say, to your eternal self, the aspect of your soul that continues to come into life and out of life and is eternal. So the higher frequency you have, of course, the more extrasensory you become as well. <laughs> That's another benefit. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was very important to clarify for the follow-up questions because I think a lot of your answers are revolved around yes. vibrations and the frequency of vibrations. And am I understanding correctly that you um, – you believe that you're more aware of being able to see the physical vibra or those vibrations, say, than your average person? From what I gather, yes. Okay. And that, yeah, that's what, that's what I gathered as well. So, And uh, what do you think caused that? Like, was there a specific time in your life when you're like, whoa, what is that? Or what's I was, going on? <laughs> no, I was born this way. I was aware that I was not seeing the same way that other people were seeing when I was about four. But according to what I have now come to understand the way that I am is actually like a disability. So when you first come into the physical dimension, you're meant to fully learn from this dimension, meaning that in order to interact with your physical reality, you close your eyes to all of the dimensional realities. And I didn't do that. So it's almost like there's a filter that was blown. Now that has benefits and detriments, the same way that coming in and only seeing the physical reality has benefits and detriments. But you can understand if you're an average person that doesn't physically see these vibrations and fractals in the air around people, you can understand vibrations based on how you feel because feeling is really the most intact sense that we have. 
when we're not considering ourselves fully extrasensory yet. You walk into a room, you know whether it feels good or it doesn't feel good. Now your mind may not be able to tell you why logically that's the case, but still you know it. And so when you're around, if I was to hand you two objects and say which one has a higher vibration, you would be able to tell me just based on how it feels. And that is um, something that seems to be a skill that has, at least around the United States traveling, it doesn't seem to be that honed in for the average person. Um, yes, because we're taught to ignore our feelings. Hmm. And I, I, you use the phrase emotional dark age. Is that kind of uh, at the workshop? Is that something that you meant by that, that we're living in an emotional oh, yeah. dark age? Yes. We, we oh. Well, from a higher perspective, let's just say that human beings have come here with the ultimate guidance system. So regardless of whether you're New Age or whether you're Christian or whether you're Buddhist or whether you're Islamic, we all have to acknowledge the fact that human beings on this earth have an internal guidance system that is felt. That's how it comes across. And in our modern day society, the process of socialization basically makes us turn our eyes and ears and senses off to our feeling based body. So the child walks into a school, he's super nervous and the teachers say, get it together, go sit in your chair. So he's got to suppress the emotion. So we value the suppression of emotion much more than the acknowledgement of emotion. And it works for socialization. You will have an individual who is able to override their emotional systems and do whatever you want them to do. But that, that individual has a very difficult time navigating themselves through life and knowing what's right for themselves. Yeah, and that, uh, that was actually one of my bullet points was I loved how you touched on how excited, excite, or anxiety and nervousness or how they're tied to excitement and how maybe because of socialization. And that's one of the things that we do at our retreat. So we try to help people. We use the phrase, lose your mind to connect to your heart, to realize that being nervous or having anxiety is just also, it's almost very, much more similar on a physical level to excitement than sometimes our minds lead us to believe. Yeah, we should talk about that for a minute because it's kind of interesting. So emotions, if you look at emotions and the study of emotions, emotions basically have to do with two components, arousal and um, balance. So arousal is all about the intensity of the emotion. And balance is all about whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. And that's really open to interpretation, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So what we're finding with emotion, and specifically with, with this concept of eustress versus distress, is that what the variable is, is the person's sense of control of their own reality surrounding whatever they're experiencing. So whether we think we're going towards something, okay, so let's start over, okay? I want to make this really understandable. Yeah, I do. I want you to as well. I think this is extremely important for everyone listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when we, when we look at the concept of anxiety, what we're looking at is something that we don't want to have happen, whereas when we're looking at something like excitement, we're looking at something that we do want to have happen, right? Um, typically, yeah. Yes. But what determines whether we want to experience or don't want to experience it? Interpretation. One person would say, hell yeah, I want to go scuba diving. That's exciting. The next person would say, hell no, I don't want to go scuba diving. That's super making me nervous. Now, the two people would be feeling very similar emotional states within the body. But their interpretation of what's going on and what's going to happen is different, which is what makes it anxiety versus excitement. So this is a major window for those of us that are working with fear, is that if you, in, if you change the interpretation of what's going on, then you change the context of the emotions. And when it comes to emotions, context is absolutely everything. That's why panic attacks kill people. It's because when you, it, you have no context for it. Like if you were to get in a high-speed car crash, oh, it's obvious why I'm feeling this way, and I'm not feeling crazy that I'm feeling this way, because it's understandable given the fact that I just got rear-ended. But if you're having that out of context, meaning you're sitting in a restaurant, there's nothing really physically going on, but you're still having that anxiety, that's when you start to spiral because the meaning changes. Now I must be crazy. That's how emotions get worse or better. So there's a lot of leeway when we're looking at our interpretation of the states that, that we're feeling or our interpretation of whatever we're going towards that changes the consistency and flavor of our emotions. 
And um, for me, I think through all of the practices that we've done, I've actually really enjoyed what most people, I imagine, would call anxiety or being uncomfortable. We've actually coined this phrase, it's actually fun comfortable. And, I, and that's what I was doing that day. I was trying to explain on stage that like, I wasn't even sure exactly what I was doing up there, but I know I was excited. Like I knew my heart was beating. I knew I was like not thinking completely clearly. I was in that kind of that almost semi-blackout phase. And I, and I find a lot of uh, – that feels really good to me. Um, it's almost, I almost sometimes wonder if I'm like an uncomfortable or a fun, comfortable addict. See, uh, some people <laughs> interpret that as very uncomfortable. So you're, you are very good at interpreting emotions in a positive light instead of a negative light, which is probably why you're doing successful work at teaching people how to switch the meaning of the experiences they're having. And do you have any advice? Um, like if you come with someone and they're very panicky or they're, oh, I'm so, that's so awkward. Like you, I, when I hear someone say awkward, I'm like, okay, you're feeling awkward and like, and it's not that the, the, the room is necessarily awkward. That's what they're feeling. It's like a projection. Um, so people there are just prone to what they would call anxiety or they can't handle panic attacks. Do you have any advice for the person that's dealing with that? Well, I have tons. <laughs> But I take a very different approach than most people do. The majority of people try to educate them in the direction of positivity. I take them in the entire other direction and go digging around in their shadows, basically, for what it is that really caused the root of that anxiety so that they can learn how to soothe themselves. We go all the way back to the root of the anxiety to do that. And that's a lot of times what you were, um, what a lot of people in the psychology field allude to, what you call that inner child work? Yeah, it ultimately ends up in inner child work every time, yes. <laughs> and um, that brings me to a point that you spoke about validating the inner child at that workshop, and I would love for you to kind of speak on that, what you mean by validating the inner child. All right. We have a major, major issue because the emotional dark age is upon us. We don't understand emotions. We don't understand that in order for people to get past emotions, they must have their emotions validated and our inner child is no different. So the reason that the inner child still exists ultimately is that its emotions, whatever it was going through, were suppressed and so that aspect of our consciousness that felt that emotion did not continue with us into adulthood. That's why it exists. So let's let's take a, a real life scenario. So kid loses his mother and he's feeling all of that grief and confusion, a hell of a lot of emotions. And the parents in his life don't know how to, to coach him through grief in order to allow him to experience grief. Instead, they just say something like, what's well, going to be okay, you know, just come sit by us, watch this TV show. Now, the kid goes, wow, there must be something wrong with the way that I'm feeling. And anything that's wrong or unacceptable, we must suppress and deny. We must annex it from our being. That's what happens with socialization. So that kid will suppress that aspect of themselves. It's almost like splitting off from their own sense of self. And that aspect that's grieving does not come forward with the rest of the individual into adulthood. So inner child work, even though it sounds like a super, you know, fluffy self-help technique, is actual soul retrieval work. Hmm. So what we do in, in um, inner child work is that we use our emotions, because that's the thing, this emotion doesn't go away. Grief keeps reflecting and reflecting. It's almost like the universe wants us to heal, wants us to be in a state of completion. So you will continue through your life if you have suppressed grief to run into situations that cause you to feel more grief. It's, it's like calling you back to the portion of yourself that is missing. So that's every new circumstance is an opportunity to allow yourself to go fully through that emotion and to come out the other side of it. Now, Obviously, we can use these like extreme emotional states that we get into, what we would call the reflection of a prior wound, to travel back and find the child who was wounded originally. And so if you look at this in the universe, it's almost like every, all timelines are branching off of that root. So if at eight I lost my mother and I felt that kind of grief, that caused my life path potentials to go in the direction of grief. But if I go back and I actually give that child validation that how they feel is okay, that means we're sitting with the child and saying, it's okay to feel this way. I'm sorry that you feel this way, but anyone would feel this way in your circumstance. In fact, I'm gonna be here and hold you with this feeling because you don't need to change it. 
Then the child says, how I feel and who I am at this moment is correct. Now what you find really quickly, especially if you work with children, is that if you validate an emotion, the child moves through it so quickly. It's unbelievable how quick. And then they're ready to move on to a higher vibrational state. So you're actually changing the vibration or frequency of that prior event. And when you do that, that must affect all of the branches that come off of that particular root. So let's say that because that grief happened when you were eight years old, you started drinking. And over the course of your life, that's how you suppressed your grief. Now, if you go back to the inner child work and you actually alter that particular original grief wounding, chances are you come back, you don't want to drink. You could be an alcoholic and like not want another drink as long as you live. It's magic stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm completely on board with this. And um, I actually can use, we can use a real life example if you're cool with that. Um, you were still eight years old, you were saying... I'm start. I was. It's been brought to my awareness recently about the um, <laughs> the subject actually of circumcision. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know you were. If you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were alluding to the idea that everything, all of our emotional trauma, is some sort of we're dealing with some sort of PTSD. Yep. And so, I know it as an eight-year-old maybe people can remember trauma, but as I, I don't think I have an explicit memory, but I was uh, cut eight days old for a bris, a Jewish tradition, and now it's something that I'm just wondering if I'm experiencing a sort of PTSD, and um, I've looked a little bit into it, and some people claim that one of the side effects of that is, uh, it is a sort of PTSD where you, the man will lose his full capacity to feel. Yes. His, like, feeling sense. Yes. Because it's like that you're welcome to the world. We're going to cut your penis and uh, you're in a tra traumatic place. Get ready to survive. <laughs> like, um, and that, when I, because I heard a podcast uh, from Daniel Vitalis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he was interviewing a Jewish doctor, I think, um, or an expert in the field who's done a lot of research in it. And when he described going to his, uh, watching a bris, um, I noticed some weird feelings coming up in me. Like he was describing how the, everyone was kind of like it was a kind of a weird denial party where people are drunk. Yep. And I talked to my parents about it, and actually it was the same thing. Like people were wasted. I was given alcohol. Um, and oh, and it depends something. how traditional too, because in the traditional setting, what Jewish rabbis do is that they have to actually suck the blood out of the penis. So there can be a lot of sexual trauma as well going on with that particular experience for young boys. Yeah, I'm happy you brought that up. I, I don't know if that happened to me or not. I don't think so. But maybe it sounds like it's a very dissociative event for a lot of the people doing the procedure. Yeah, completely. But we are, you know, captains at this association. So I guess that brings me to PTSD, circumcision, <laughs> um, inner yeah. infant work. Like how do you go about like an inner infant implicit memory or implicit trauma? Well, infants experience the world through felt perception more so than visual perception or cognitive understanding. So oftentimes with an infant memory, what will happen is that you may not, you may or you may not get the images associated with it, or they may be very blurry because that's actually how the infant sees. But you will more feel sensations. So you can feel the sensation of being rocked, or you can feel the sensation of like, you know, like children, let's say you've got a tiny baby, and you've got the moro reflex, which is how they survive. The moro reflex prevented us, they think, from falling out of trees. So if you put a, a tiny baby on its back instead of up like this where it's holding on, it instantly shoots its arms and legs out sideways. So that kind of a sensation comes in response to the feeling of being completely exposed. So you may just get that intense body sensation. And when I say intense, some of these inner child work sessions where you actually integrate the feeling that the infant had are so intense that it feels like somebody has injected you with some sort of a drug. So you will get those intense body flushes. You may feel like you have absolutely no control over your body. A lot of times when I'm working with people, they'll feel like they can't turn over because, of course, the, the infant lacks the capability to do that when it's very young. So we're working with body sensation, but we have to look at, at memory in a much more rounded way because we're so like visually centered that we don't understand that auditory is memory, smells is memory, the sensations we have in our body is memory. So if you're getting some of the picture back and not all of it, you're still having memory and it's still a valid experience. Hmm. 
And so how would you recommend, like if I wanted to explore this for myself um, and maybe try to do a healing around that, would you recommend a specific technique or? I would recommend, well, you can do it one of two ways. I usually like to work with emotions as they come up in real time. So if you're having, so for a man, let's say that he's having like some sort of a sexual issue. At that moment, he could have a conversation with his, his um, partner and say, I really need right now to go into this. And so at that moment that he's feeling the intensity of that emotion of like failure or of whatever it is relative to sexuality, he could sit down and, and go into the emotion and completely let it play out in his body almost like he's just observing how it's going. Then he can ask, when was the first time I experienced this feeling? Now you have to surrender. You can't go like logically look for it. You have to surrender to the experience. And what will happen is your being kind of pulls you back to that experience. So suddenly it'll feel like that emotion intensifies or you might even be in a full-blown memory where you're like, oh my gosh, I can see my dad. He's standing right over me, stuff like that. Okay, cool. Maybe that'll plant a seed that something I can work on in the future. So appreciate you <laughs> sharing that. Um, you can trigger yourself intentionally if you want to, though. So, like, for example, when you were watching that particular thing on circumcision, you could feel all those emotions coming up. That's the perfect time to go into it. Yeah. I've heard that there's, like, YouTube videos. Yeah, I know people that are against it. It was like, well, just, watch, just watch a video and you'll be super against, against it. it. Um, I haven't if watched there, a video. Yeah, well, good luck. I am very publicly against it, so. Yeah, and I, I, um, I ha I'm cut, and I am against it as now as well. <laughs> After just doing like a brief amount of research, and it was just like one of those what I would describe as like a peephole to the matrix. It's like, wait a minute, why, why are we doing this? Like, when you really think about it, then uh, <laughs> just take a little deeper look rather than just. But apparently, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield used to cover female. I guess they call it uh, female genitalia or genital mutilation mm -hmm. um, up to the 77 and it was covered in the United States. Now it's outlawed. So there's a, I think there's a, some pioneers in the movement right now being like, Hey, it's still going on with men. Like open your eyes, open your heart. Yep. Um, which brings me to a subject. I read your blog about uh, Ebola mm -hmm. and um my brother just got back from Kenya, actually, and so uh, Africa has been a little bit more on the radar than usual. And um, from what I'm understanding, female genital mutilation goes on. There are certain tribes, so the father, so the daughter is fit to marry, and the father can sell her daughter for cattle. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, <laughs> you know, hearing that is just like, whoa, what planet is that, or where was what what sci-fi? Like dark sci-fi thriller is that? Not a thriller, just like a horror movie. But uh, I get apparently it's actually going on. Oh yeah. And I think you kind of tied that that level of consciousness. You can correct me if I'm wrong once again, but into maybe why Africa experiences some of the things it does, such as Ebola. Yeah. Was that kind of what you were saying? Yes. Do you want to kind of uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Well, uh, looking at the, so, okay, this is going to be difficult for people to grasp, but when your consciousness is not completely restricted to this dimension, you're actually capable to go to multidimensional realities. So, a lot, so if we're going to look at this through a religious context instead of through a non-religious context, a lot of your prophets or whatever had the capacity to look at multiple timelines for the universe. That's how they're able to see what's going to happen in the future. In order to do that, all you're doing is raising your consciousness to a higher dimensional plane where all timelines coexist. So it's no more difficult to see what's going to happen tomorrow than it is for me to look at the floor right there, even though to a, an ant, the floor might be a different dimensional reality than the bed that I'm sitting on. So I'm actually able to get my frequency out. And what you find when you take an overview of the vibrational content of our world is that there are these pockets of like super dark energy. And the only reason that it comes across as dark is that the frequency is vibrating so low that when the particles bounce off of it, it they get absorbed instead of reflected. That's why it would appear light versus dark. But that super low frequency corresponds to a really low level of consciousness in that particular area. So it's what we talked about before. It's that these, the people who are living in these kinds of countries, they are experiencing extreme levels of poverty, you know? Yeah. 
and there and in order to experience extreme levels of poverty you have to be out of alignment with your own eternal self because if you're in alignment with your eternal self then you're completely aware that energy is eternal and unlimited there's no limit to consciousness there's no limit to energy in the universe and so abundance is like natural to your experience you know <laughs> that's why at the highest levels of consciousness you can manifest things all you want to but in the lower density places you've got serious levels of powerlessness right and these people what they're having to do essentially is to survive in every way that they possibly can I mean most of them are eating bush meat that's their their typical food which is of course the physical explanation for why they have Ebola but if you want to look at it on a vibrational level in order to keep suffering so let's take a look at the average po person who's impoverished they really don't have the luxury of thinking about how they're feeling today they have to go out and work they have to do whatever it takes to make everybody live and to do that they have to split off from the way that they're feeling so it's almost like they're checking out of their experience instead of instead of being really with themselves and doing what's really right for themselves emotionally and mentally and physically right they have to basically check out from the way they're feeling check out from their experience and just make it happen doesn't matter whether it's digging through the trash can or whatever but we gotta understand about viruses that they check in when we check out so we're vacating the building in order to survive and they're saying ooh yay this is an untended cell <laughs> let's get in there <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I was. I thought that blog you wrote was definitely a powerful perspective that uh, I was not just ready to ignore. I definitely was considering it, and because you know you hear so many. It was such a hot topic for a while. I'm not sure if it still is. I barely really watch the news, but um, I know it was like floating around Facebook for a while there. It'll be a hot topic until they figure out what vaccine to use, and then it'll be fine because they'll sell it to everyone. <sighs> that's uh, yeah. That's another whole interview I guess <laughs> um, on a lighter note I really enjoyed how you told the story of some of the um, Olympic athletes that you were involved with and how <laughs> they were sometimes painting a picture when they would do interviews that they they almost it was almost deceptive in the sense they like worked really hard to get there and when based on your reality it was almost like it wasn't much work at all they kind of <laughs> just did that because that's what you were supposed to say Yes. Um, I, and I loved how you said that true success is maybe something that you don't have to work as hard as you think for it. You know? Oh, yeah. You want me to expand on that? For sure, for sure. Okay, so for those of, those people who aren't familiar with me, after I escaped from, like, the abuse in my childhood, I had no other skill set except for skiing. So I actually became a professional skier. And because of that, I was surrounded by Olympic athletes because all the winter sports athletes are all put in one location. So we're all around each other. And because I got to know so many of these Olympic athletes, and these are gold medal winners, you know, <laughs> I, got to, I got a real wake-up call, basically, about what creates success. Because I knew them. I was around them on a daily basis. These people had a very different attitude than the rest of us did. I mean, I was a good skier, but by no means was I going to be, like, the best of the best in the entire world. And it was frustrating me back then because I couldn't understand what I really wanted yet. So I thought what I really, really wanted was to get a gold medal. That was my whole passion and purpose. But it's super frustrating to want that and then to go to the hill and you're struggling. I was like puking before every race. I hated that crap. And next to me, here's this person that's like, I love it. I'm so excited. The course looks awesome. And I'm like, I'm so frustrated. Why can't I have that attitude? Now, these people who really love it, I mean, they love every minute of it. It's, we can't call what they're doing effort. Like, it's not hard for them. Even though they may be exerting a lot of energy, it's not the same kind of resistance that we feel when we're doing something that is not feeling good to us. So we, of course, love to make all these programs about them during the Olympics that make it look like, oh, they've overcome so much and tried so hard, struggled so much to get to where they are. But if you hang around them on a daily basis, they want to do that 18th lap. They want to go down the hill as fast as they can. And so, like, you know, it was a surprise because back then I wasn't really admitting to what I really liked about sports. I mean, granted, I really love skiing. I love skiing. I hate racing. I could never admit that to myself. What I loved is the feeling of putting on a uniform. I loved that feeling of being respected, you know, by the rest of the group because everyone looked down on me growing up. 
I was the most ostracized person growing up, and so I belonged somewhere. Not only did I belong somewhere, people wanted my autograph. That was what I really liked, and so I just had to jump through the hoop of races to get there. Make sense? Yeah. yeah. So I think a lot of us, we struggle and struggle at things that we don't think we can achieve because we're not being truly honest with ourselves about what we really like. And now, like when I'm in this position, looking back at that, I'm like, thank God I don't have to compete anymore. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I uh, I definitely like to check in with myself to make sure whatever I'm doing, it's coming from a place of passion rather than obligation. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was the uh, it might have been the s s CEO of FedEx or something, but he had the most powerful phrase he ever had as a business owner was, "I don't know. What do you think?" <laughs> and just to make sure that people were checking in with themselves and they were involved and they were coming from a place that. You know, they, they they were making the choices. It wasn't this obligation. And sometimes I see that, like, people get trapped in this, the workforce, and they're doing something they don't want to do. And I see it's like you're working way much harder than you would need to if you were just doing something you loved. Oh, yeah. But, um... But that's the limit. We're, we cognitively think that there's a limit to what we can get what we want through. So I was convinced there's no other way I'm going to gonna fulfill these things that I actually love about this through any other venue than sports. It was just a super, what I was not doing essentially was trusting the universe that if I went in the direction of things that felt good every day, that that perfect package, that thing that I was absolutely built and made for would fall in my lap. We have to understand that our potential, we weave it before we get here. You can't want something that's not meant to be yours. So that story that we keep telling ourselves that you can desire things that you're not meant to achieve is absolute crap. Hmm. And how do you suggest people knowing what they were meant to achieve or how do they figure that out? I suggest they stop knowing. They stop even thinking about it. I think what they should prioritize more than anything is the way they feel. They should start realizing what is it that I'm doing on a daily basis or what can I try to do, of course, if you haven't even allowed yourself that, that makes the hours just disappear for me. What could I do that just fuels me up, that makes me want to live and wake up tomorrow? Now that is what your purpose and passion is going to be. We are not living in a universe with a vindictive, all-knowing being that wants you to suffer. Like you are, your passion and your joy are absolutely synonymous. So if you keep doing what makes you happy, what you'll notice is that your purpose, what that looks like, and usually we mean a job, falls right into your lap and you're like, oh my gosh, I would never have thought of this. Maybe it's a position I'm meant to invent, you know? Yeah, lost in the moment. Sometimes I describe and I just lost track of time. And when I'm losing track of time, I know something, I'm doing something right. Or That's exactly I'm vibrating at a higher frequency. You so are. That's how it should be. That is exactly how it should be. And right. it's, it's, we basically, we go about it the hard way, which is what people really need to learn to stop, how to stop doing. We basically make everything about the middleman. So the middleman would be a job, right? So I, I'm going to my job to make money because I think money would make me happy. <laughs> Now, we, our job may be making us miserable, so we're making ourselves miserable to get to the happiness we think that miserable job's going to get us to. So we need to cut out the middleman, which is always the how. How am I going to get to that happiness? We cut out the middleman, we do what makes us happy, and the how is actually done by the universe. So it's a very it's a super, actually that's forwards, but we think it's backwards way of doing things. <laughs> Speaking of, how's the uh, interview going for you? I really like it. Are you losing track of time? I always lose track of time when I'm talking about this stuff. <laughs> Good, just making sure. <laughs> um, let's see. Speaking of that, I, I, all right, this is actually a good uh, transition. I've noticed myself a little bit, like, I usually don't have, like, a list of questions I'm going to ask someone, but this time I did it for whatever reason, and I noticed myself maybe getting, like, a little more, like, a bullet point and being caught up in that than being lost in the moment. And, uh, I think that's something I'm really good at and something that frees me when I can share some maybe fun, comfortable shares, like admitting maybe I'm not as present as I want to be. And, um, and I remember you, you looking at that note, you said authenticity always wins, and that's something I believe. Um, I would love for you to expand upon that, what you mean by authenticity always wins. <laughs> All right, so we are a society of people that live upon pretense. It's not okay to have angry feelings, so it doesn't matter whether you feel angry, you've got to say you're okay. And so we are basically walking around as split individuals. We are not whole individuals. 
we've got an aspect of our outer self that does not match our inner self. And so we can have no real healing, no real progression in that state. So for example, let's say somebody doesn't think that jealousy is okay. And so their friend wins something that they wanted to win. And they say, I'm so happy for you. I love it. It's so great. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So if they have that type of an attitude, then what you watch is there's a discrepancy between their outer world and their inner world. And that is acute levels of torture. Because at some level you're saying, I hate you. You're unacceptable for the way you really are to yourself. It breeds self-hatred. So what's more beneficial is if you actually like own up to the fact that that's coming up for you. You say, I'm feeling really super jealous right now. Let's focus on what I'm really feeling. Because we can't make it good or bad unless we're willing to suppress it, right? <laughs> so in our life, what you'll find is that the most successful people got to a point in their life where they were like, I can't do this anymore. I can't live an external life and an internal life and have those two things be so separate. I can't rectify me. And when, they're, when they get to that point is when they start making decisions according to how they really feel and they start dealing with the real emotions. So when you deal with the real emotion of jealousy, you have the opportunity to actually move through jealousy into higher emotional states. But as long as you're denying it, you're stuck in it. Yeah, that's like, that's basically one of the main points of the retreats that we do is this idea that what you resist persists. Yeah. So let's share what's coming up, let what come up, come out and feel the connection to yourself or connection to a higher source through that. And uh, it actually turns out to be quite comedic uh, because I have two brothers and a lot of times it's just like, oh, I'm jealous. Not like, you know, one of us is like, I'm feeling jealousy or like, I'm feeling shame. Like, and we like announce it. Like people typically talk about the weather. Yeah. And when you kind of have that playfulness around it, that seems to help a lot of the people that we work with. Good. And it's definitely helped us. And I, yeah, I, when you said, when you were touching on that idea, I was like, yeah, we have a lot more. Maybe, I know on a stage, I was just up there being as authentic as I could. And I sometimes get um, addicted to feeling fun, comfortable, as I talked about earlier. So I think I was maybe attaching more to what we would disagree upon, just because that seemed more, more fun, comfortable. <laughs> but uh, you're definitely saying we are on the same page on a lot of aspects. And... Um, I personally really love having friends and I, I love having connections based on disagreement um, rather than only trying to surround myself with people that I agree with because I feel like maybe a lot of growth takes place when I find someone where we bump heads about an issue and we can not, you know, as long as there's a certain parameter set, not using uh, violence or not walking away in the middle of the conversation, but really staying true to it and sticking with each other and having a certain set of agreements that I find a lot of uh, actually we think one of the most neglected forms of love is sharing our resentments. Mm, that's a good, that's a nice concept. And, and, and you've probably experienced how, how freeing it is to have somebody unconditionally accept the person that you are. Now, when you bury yourself to someone, say I'm jealous or I'm, I'm doing something that other people might think is unacceptable and that I'm tempted to deny or suppress on myself because I don't think it's acceptable, to have somebody receive that and to just have it be okay that that is the truth of yourself at this moment. That is our closest crack that we have at the feeling of love. Hmm. Our original wounding is that there are aspects of ourselves that were seen as unacceptable and aspects of our self that were seen as acceptable. And was there a breaking point for you when you were like, uh, F it, I'm going to have to just be who I am? Like, how do you describe that as what truly successful people are? And for me, it's a daily practice, but I was wondering if you had like an epiphany one day or it's like... Yeah, I did actually. What I started to see, when I first started my career, I didn't have the blog, right? And I would sit up on stage and I, you know, people would treat me like I was a god, basically, because I was able to tell them stuff I shouldn't know and all of that kind of stuff. And it felt awesome to begin with. I'll just tell you, I was like, hell, this is heaven to be treated like this for once instead of have people just hate who I am and tell me I'm evil. That's great. But what I started to notice is that everyone started putting the responsibility of their lives on me. And not only that, there started to be a ma like a super intense separation between where I was and where they were. And the worshipping element basically made me really nervous because what I noticed is it was separating people from their own sense of godliness, if you want to use that word. It's like in, in, the role of any good spiritual teacher ultimately is to bring someone to the point where they can have the connection to source energy by themselves. 
They don't need to go through prophets or priests or anybody to get to it. Now that's a successful teacher. What I was doing was the exact opposite. And I would hear people come up and say, well, you're probably just like completely forgiving, so tell me how you did it. And I was like, no, 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 no. There's a lot I haven't forgiven. My gosh, I'm not talking enough about this. So I started, when I started to realize, and that was like the epiphany moment for me was like a, oh my gosh, strike from above type of a moment where I was like, I have to rip this to shreds. I have got to take this idea, basically, that anybody exists in a state of perfection and destroy it. But in order to do that, I have to expose all of my imperfections. And it's going to scare people, and it's going to alienate the hell out of them. And a lot of people are not going to want to follow a you know, spiritual teacher who's not in a state of perfection, who admits that she gets angry sometimes. That's super, like, that's career suicide. But there is also a really beautiful vision on the other side, which is that, number one, I don't have to pretend. I will be followed by people who understand that everybody has their own process. And so when I say, yeah, I'm really struggling with issues right now and this is what they are, they'd be like, oh, good, I'm going through that too. Right? That and it wouldn't, be, that it wouldn't be torture. Exactly. So it was scary. I mean, it was, I, w I went through, of course, because I'm in the public eye, it was like really scary. But um, it was pretty amazing what happened because I was scared to death. And that, like when I did that first blog, where I started, you know, I let people into my world a little bit about the stuff that I still struggle with, about the fact that it's like I can get triggered <laughs> really easy um, because of the abuse that I went through. I kind of like braced myself because I was like, the reaction's gonna, I'm gonna lose so many followers today. Just, ugh. and and I did lose some, you know, so some of them were like, I don't feel comfortable following somebody who's in that kind of a state. And then they bounced off, but the, there was a whole other group that was so ready for it and so got it that they were like, oh my gosh, this is groundbreaking stuff. Now, if my teacher can be authentic, I can be authentic. Now, this is the permission for them to say, guess what? We're all in a state of progression. There's no such thing as the enlightened retirement. And then everything got so much better. It's, it's so much less exhausting. I mean, there's no image to maintain. <laughs> yeah, uh, congratulations on that. I think that's and I, and I imagine for you to daily practice as well and I, yeah. and I want people listening to know that um, people that know about us or people that know about you that it still takes for me it takes courage every day yep to be myself me too and um, <laughs> yeah me too because not a lot of people are going to love you for it but some will and those are the ones that really matter and yeah what I found is all of a sudden I uh, I may have lost some relationships I think the quantity of my friends may have gone down but all of a sudden the quality of my friends like sky way more than compensated than the yes. quantity yeah just like French cuisine <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah it's just all of a sudden you get people coming to your life they're interested yeah. in that yes. and that's just I just love having my wife like that my brothers and other certain group of friends that we can just put it all out there and let the chips fall where they may and still be with each other through the scary times. Yes, it's awesome. The crisis of, the crisis of today becomes the joke of tomorrow, at least for me. <laughs> um, and you uh, mentioned something about forgiveness, and that was one of the things that stuck with me the most out of your workshop. Um, I know we, you know, we'll disagree maybe about what Jesus means to me and what Jesus means to you. Mm -hmm. um, I would be more of a, not necessarily your traditional Christian, but more of like a Jesus follower, and I believe he was the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, and he was perfect. Um, I, and I don't want this to be a debate about that. What I love that you said was the part that we agree on was that we can debate in other terms. I, I don't want people to get scared that we're not going to debate at all, but maybe when we see in person one day in Utah, who knows. But um, you talked about how forgiveness and approval are on the same vibrational frequency, mm -hmm. and I thought about uh, Jesus being nailed to the cross and before while it was going on he called out to Yahweh to God and said forgive them for they do not know what they are doing mm -hmm. and uh, I was like yeah that's and when you said the approval thing I was like yeah of course Jesus approved that's how he forgave it wasn't just something he said and I, if you could expand upon what you mean by forgiveness and approval being on the same vibrational frequency well we look at forgiveness as just letting go but you're not going to be able to let go of something that you don't really like basically you know what I mean by that is that I feel like in most of the self-help field in the religious field like all of it we exalt this idea of forgiveness as if it's possible to just decide to do it you know without having any perspective and perspective is absolutely necessary 
Now, when you look at the vibration of forgiveness, it's identical to the vibration of approval. That means we, in order to really, truly forgive something, we're not looking to just get over it. We're looking to assimilate it completely in our life. And to assimilate something, you have to approve of it. So to assimilate the experience of being nailed to the cross, essentially, he had to approve of that entire act somehow. Now, you can approve, like, you know, maybe you don't, you don't approve of murder, right? But there's some element in something you experience that's painful that you have to approve of in order to fully forgive it. So I'll give you a personal example if you want it. Do you want the personal example? Yeah, for sure. Because this dawned on me after years of therapy. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, I think it's a huge point, a scary point. I don't think many people like hearing that. Like, oh, I'll, I'll forgive them, but I won't. I can't approve them. I'll, I'll stop listening now. Well, that's because we think approval is, is to make something right. And I feel like we get lost in the idea of rightness and wrongness to a really unhealthy degree. Because it's all a matter of perspective, I can tell you that. You know, there are people who are over, you will never be able to win an argument about what's right or wrong because based on your beliefs or whatever, it's right or wrong, <laughs> you know? Ugh, it just gets shady. But anyways, <clears throat> so, so let's go back with forgiveness. So when I was in all of these therapy sessions, people kept saying, you just got to forgive and move on, forgive and move on. Like I was cutting some piece of myself off and calling it a good, right? A, could never make that happen. B, never met anyone else who could. C, I'm like, this doesn't work because I'm leaving some aspect of myself there, you know? And when I really looked at it, I mean, like, because of being extrasensory, when I really looked at the two frequencies close, close enough, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, these two things are so identical. Why are they identical? And then it dawned on me, but it only dawned on me later. So you've got what I went through as a child, which is just, you know, like super bad torture. And one would say you can't ever approve of that. Why would you ever approve of a child being taken or a child being, you know, prostituted or all of the various things which happened? It's not about approving of the action. What it is is about approving of the role of it in your life. So when I look back from my perspective now, what I'm starting to see is that without that experience, nothing that I am today could have happened. Now, I can say that because it sounds inspirational, but when that becomes like a true authentic experience, when you're like, holy cow, I can see a vision now where, you know, women, let's just look at it on this scale. And people may call this like a super grandiose sense of self, but what the hell? Ready? So let's pretend, basically, that people really need an example of an empowered female. An empowered female would have to have a grasp of what females have gone through over a century. So I'm essentially a microcosm of females' troubles, running up against religious oppression, being seen as a heretic, running up against men trying to use me for sex, trying to dominate, all of that kind of thing, losing babies. I mean, if you, if you look at what I went through, it is literally just like it's a jam-packed 13-year spread of every issue that women go through worldwide and have for thousands of years. So in order for me to reach this exalted state, essentially, of healing and of integration, I would, of course, have to have experienced those types of things. How the hell else am I supposed to teach women to get past that? So now when I'm looking back, I'm like, it's like, wow, you, can, you, can't, you can't create a weapon without the fire. Anything that turns and that becomes this beautiful kind of creation, essentially, has to go through the fires. And it's, it was interesting to me because I thought about it. And there's this, this really good quote. Now, I'm not going to remember who did it. But <laughs> basically, the quote was that anything that burns bright must endure burning. Anything that is light must endure burning. And I, I was like, okay, well, let's see how to, how to really embrace that. And so that, on top of looking, so it's all about shifting perspective. On top of looking at the fact that this particular man who I had with me, who took me, essentially, I mean, I watched his struggle every day. I started to really see what created this person who was no monster at all, but was instead just a person who was suffering so bad that he just could do nothing but cause it with other people. And my heart started to break open to a kind of empathy when previously I just wanted to burn into the ground. 
And when that, and it was organic, I couldn't have forced that. When that kind of light broke through and I started seeing that aspect of himself, I started getting less afraid of him, more compassionate towards him, and more interested in solving the issue at large. How do we, how do we make it so that these criminals, so to speak, don't really feel the urge to do these things? And now it's like a greater vision made it so that I can't make an enemy of my childhood anymore because there's no possibility for me without that. So that caused an approval of what went on. And that approval is the, close, the closest you get to forgiveness. That's when you start to feel that thing which we call forgiveness, which is the, you're really, you're not looking back at it as if it's destroyed everything. You're looking back at it as if it actually added something to your life. Yeah, no, I think that's really inspirational. And definitely, I hope a lot of people hear that message over and over again. So thank you for sharing that. And I know uh, we're getting closer to an hour, so I had an idea because you seem to ha you have just, in my opinion, such fascinating and valuable perspectives on so many different topics. That kind of like a, a popcorn in the way of not just like a one word, but maybe I was just going to bring up some big topics, and you could just give like a real short answer or just like your short perspective. On oh my that. gosh! Okay. So uh, one being, and I'm sure you get exposed to, the, or people around you are into this since it seems to be making a lot of a uh, gateway in the spiritual world, but like, uh, I don't know what, how you would classify them, LSD, magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, bog, whatever the other root Spiritual is. drugs. Spiritual drugs, there you go. <laughs> I, okay, only to be used, you really want a super short answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah unless it depends, yeah, yeah, that might get, that we can it short this whole interview maybe to an hour <laughs> spiritual drugs only to be used in circumstances where they should be used meaning that these these drugs essentially are a crutch when you were feeling like you're up against the wall or you're absolutely desperate and there's you feel like there's no way to break through I don't feel like they should ever be used for recreational purposes and they should never be used long term thank you um, what about homosexuality um both a soul contract, but also often the cause of serious issues between parent and child when the child is very young, toddler age. And hopefully, I know these are huge topics, and I'm asking this is a yeah, I'm like, challenging how do you thing. do a popcorn thing? That's just <laughs> but, but I do want, I, maybe, hopefully, it'll lead people, more people to your channel and finding out, because I've I'm imagining you've done specific videos on each yes. some of these topics, and people can do yes. the research. Maybe this will kind of be a gateway to more uh, more teal in their life. <laughs> um, what about uh, bipolarity? Like both bipolarity, meaning bipolar disorder, yeah, or having a word bipolarity. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, someone that's struggling with uh, what they've been diagnosed with bipolar. If they believe they're bipolar, or does it? I exist? don't believe it. You don't believe in it, okay? No. All right. And then what about depression? Depression is self-hatred and anger turned inwards towards the self. It's you oppressing yourself, essentially, with those types of energies. Yep, that's what I say. I, I always say depression is suppression of emotions, basically. Yep. Real pain is pain denial. Or that's yes. where real suffering takes place. Exactly. What about uh, sleep? What is it for, sleep? Sleep is a reset. So, you're, and of course, the body also integrates a lot of memory during sleep. But during sleep, your consciousness retreats all the way back to source energy, back to that united consciousness. And in that state of allowing, the body can heal itself and a lot of other things can happen. So, then it comes back. And what about dreams? Dreams. You are out of body, actually, for dreams. But you're, ex you're experiencing a multidimensional reality, the fifth and sixth dimensions, mostly. When you come back into your physical body, your brain then, in split seconds, interprets the entire experience. Awesome. And then um, what about Jesus? I know you has, I think you said he, in your opinion, he was the ultimate empath. Is there anything more you would yes. like to add to that? Jesus, ultimate empath, serious teacher and leader, obviously. <laughs> he was trying to teach people that their mind was what created the reality that they lived in, hence why he demonstrated so many awesome, what they call city abilities, which are abilities that come along with your frequency increasing and becoming closer to God. Awesome, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop there because I do want to introduce you to JP and Diana and my brother, okay. but um, I know you ended the workshop with uh, something that I thought was 
I've actually come up with an acronym for it myself because I thought it was so important, but I think I call it RUVA, like the recognizing, <laughs> understanding, validating, and acknowledging. Yeah. Would you like to leave us with that? Yes. So we, because we have a difficult time dealing with our own emotions, we don't know how to deal with other people's emotions either. And so this thing you're calling RUVA is a really good way to deal with your own emotions and other people's emotions. The first step one is whenever you're dealing with an issue, so I'll just explain it like you. Let's say you're dealing with an issue. Mm -hmm. Now you feel the emotions coming up. What you have to do and what I have to do is to first recognize the emotion. I have to see that it is happening, that it is there. I cannot be in denial. Recognition is the enemy of denial. Once I recognize that, I have to try to understand it. Meaning that, I mean, I, obviously, once you recognize something, you have to find some way to cognitively figure out the context of why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And the third step, validating, is the most crucial step which is that we have to make what you're feeling right. So that's when we say, wait, that's when we say something like, I think that it's completely okay for you to think that, yes. So we don't necessarily need to validate that somebody is, is correct in their thinking to validate an emotion. So let's say that you were saying, you were saying something like, oh God, I feel like, you know, he just thinks I'm such an idiot and because of that I feel so unworthy. I don't say, you're right, you're unworthy to validate. <laughs> What I say is, yeah, I can completely, that's validating, I can completely understand why you would feel that way in that circumstance. So do you feel like that felt like when I just said that? This is a fake scenario and both of us just had the emotional reaction to that. That validation gives us permission to feel the way we feel and more importantly to move through the emotion. Now the next step is to allow the emotions. That means that we have to fully give ourselves and other people permission to feel the way we feel. So when we are dealt with something like grief or jealousy, we're not instantly trying to feel better or feel different. We're trying to get better at feeling those things. So we let ourselves experience the grief. What does this feel like? If it had a color, what color would it be? We completely feel that way. And then when we feel ready or we feel relief, usually relief is the byproduct of allowing ourselves to feel certain things. The relief that we feel is the indication that it's time for us to move into a higher vibration. Then and only then can you give somebody advice. Or can we do the standard procedures for moving into a better feeling space? <laughs> yeah, and I, um, I agree when you were talking about that at the workshop, how a lot of people just want to jump to giving advice and just bypassing the rest of those steps. But uh, I think the person feels bypassed, and it's harder for to their, take their advice. Yeah, they feel bypassed, and they feel like what they feel is inappropriate, so that breeds denial and suppression. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was great advice. Something I uh, imagine I'll take with me for the rest of my life, actually. Goody. So thank you for that acronym. <laughs> You're welcome. And then um, for people on the Rob Raws that are listening, how do they find out more about you? Well, they can find me on Facebook, and they can also find me on YouTube. My channel is the Spiritual Catalyst channel, and I put a video out every single Saturday where people ask me questions, and I will pick one of those questions and then answer it in video format, so it's pretty interesting. Who knows what I'm going to do next? Um, I also have a website, www.tealswan.com, and that has a listing of all of my workshops and anything we're doing, so you can just go peruse around there, too. Awesome. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's great connecting with you again. You know, the <laughs> first time was a little, there, I guess there were a lot of people watching. I guess there was a lot of people watching this time, too, but, you know, less in our face. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think you offer some super valuable valuable perspectives and whether or not someone like agrees with everything you say man they definitely I think it's definitely <laughs> worth listening De definitely seeing what takes place uh, just letting some seeds be planted small seeds turn into big trees and uh, yeah I look forward to seeing you again I don't know where it'll be I mean, we've never actually been snow skiing so uh, we have a friend that does um, a company has a company in Utah and we were thinking about maybe going to try skiing or snowboarding well, I will be here if you want to. <laughs> yeah, we'll stay in touch. And um, yeah, I don't know if you're. You, he, I think Sardeep said he might, you might put this on your channel if you do. Yes. Definitely, we're the Rob Raz, which is all. <laughs> it's we have our same thing: YouTube, Facebook, website, and it's R A W B R A H S. And uh, teal is Rob Raz approved. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we don't agree on everything but that doesn't mean she can't be approved and I'm happy I'm really happy that my wife had uh, you know found out about you and you know 
exposed us to you. And you want to say hi to JP and her? And yes, I do. Let's see. Let me. I'm gonna get you off this headphone audio. J Jumbo Pumpkin, <laughs> Deanna, and Jumbo Pumpkin. So wait, how did you guys meet each other? I want to know. They were standing on the side of the road looking really hungry. They had one of those cardboard signs that said, we'll do anything for food. And I said, I've got so many things you can do. <laughs> do you have a more accurate uh, That's a good question. Um, oh, yeah. JP brought me to a really good coffee shop, and I told him how bad his coffee was. And I think he, I think he fell in love with me at that point. He's like, this guy's going to... This guy's going to tell me how it is. And we kind of stayed friends ever since then. Um, and that's, I think we were all at that coffee shop. Yeah. Well, uh, not Timothy. Me and you were. But, yeah, and then my mom had sex with his dad. He's also <laughs> my dad. Um, a few years after they did it for me. And we've been, we've been in love since. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you, Teal. That was amazing. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, just click on me so you can subscribe to her channel, youtube.com slash the spiritual catalyst if you want to get addicted to the truth through some very fun comfortable edutaining videos click on the picture of my beautiful family and me below at youtube.com slash robras if you want to join uh, the jolly pumpkin and get ultra spiritual click on my ginger friend down there at youtube.com slash awaken with jp and if you just want to get ultra awesome and beautiful like my lovely lady Click on her below at youtube.com slash do it with Diana. And if you're listening to this through a podcast, uh, let me take this opportunity to shit on you and uh, ask you to do all those call to actions to help spread this message to the world because the world is starving for this edutainment. So thank you so much, Teal, for giving your gifts and you being you. And uh, maybe we'll get that fun, comfortable, therapeutic, whatever those extra two hours were up on video in the podcast soon. Um, until then, peace and baby.